<laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Jeff Hickson. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for the Major League Baseball Players Alumni. Uh, I've been with the organization for 26 years. We promote the sport of baseball, raise money for charity, address the unique need of the former player is our main missions. We also have a huge memorabilia division, and we do a lot of different things with guys like our former players. Um, and we're going to talk to some of those today. Actually, just one. Um, but the whole theory is um, make these guys a, a couple bucks and, and get memorabilia that, from their closet out into y'all's hands. And here's some stories along the way of where these stuff, the stuff came from. Um, we've done this for a lot of, a lot of years. The organization has been around for 42 years. Uh, there are only 22,000 guys ever to play the game at the big league level. It's a pretty damn small fraternity. And um, we got in the memorabilia business for that very reason, because take care of the boys and, and go direct with your sources to the guys that played the game at the highest level. So I say all that to introduce our, our speaker today, our uh, longtime friend. And uh, I've known this gentleman for 26 years. Um, he's done a lot with this organization. He's one of the, the linchpins of why this organization has grown the way it has with his contributions of time and effort trying to make this organization better. So um, he is a, he was a right-handed pitcher from 1958 to 69, primarily with the Cleveland Indians. Career totals include 121 big league wins with a 3.68 ERA. Was a four-time All-Star, even though he did it in three years, because a lot of people don't know there used to be two All-Star games in a year, not just one. Uh, he was a four-time All-Star, 60, 66, and 68 and a member of the 1967 AL champion Boston Red Sox, named one of the greatest 100 Cleveland Indians of all time, our longtime buddy, Mr. Gary Bell. Hello, hello. I should have got more money. <laughs> if you were playing today, you would have a whole lot more money to buy drinks. I'll guarantee you that. Well, you never bought one, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. I've, I've supported you for a long time. Brooks, can we talk called Brooks Robinson, Robinson that night. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay. Jerry Bell and I have, have run across a lot of people and, and made some phone calls from some places to uh, our former <laughs> members. And yeah, we've had some fun. Uh, uh, thanks for being here, GB. Good okay. to see you, man. I look forward to it. This is kind of fun. First time I've been interviewed in 50 years. I know. <laughs> It, well, I, you know, I love you and, and the alumni loves you and people out there, a lot more people than you probably want to admit, know who you are. Uh, good news, bad news and everything in between. So, <laughs> um, listen, we, we've, you and I sit around and talk about memorabilia a lot for all these years and, and you've made the, made the comment, you know, you guys didn't do that. You didn't collect memorabilia when you were playing. Well, that's true. Not, not, not I probably threw a hundred grand worth of Mickey Mantle bubblegum cards in the garbage you know it was just a different era right i mean who, who was the who was your pitching coach was it joe cronin no joe cronin how, how old do you think i am man well i thought he was a spring <laughs> training one year with you I, I i maybe i'm making that up but i think you are really he, old by the way he'd be 120 now so. i think it's more than that <laughs> let me look um, him up <laughs> mel, mel harder was my first pitching coach okay baseball. Got it. Well, those guys, all those Indians that when you started were still around. I mean, it was, you know, the Fellers and the Garcias and, and Lemons and all those guys, right? Well, Feller was gone. I think his last year was 55 and I came up at 58. But Lemon, Wynn, Garcia, Score, Narleski, Masi, all those guys were still on the team, yeah. And Feller was always around. Don't He might not have been there. He was just around all the time and, and we all know Buck. He, he he was my he was my buddy. We used to go on cruises with the Indians, and and he knew that I liked uh, World War II and all that all that stuff and politics. And he did, he didn't ask you. He just said, "Bell, you're sitting with me." I said, "Okay, sir." <laughs> <laughs> Bob was one of a kind, man, and the uh, the big he joke was. was for for so many years the the uh, hardest piece of memorabilia to get in Cleveland was a baseball not signed by Bob Feller. That's true. I'll tell you one thing. He was one hell of a pitcher, though. And, and remember, he lost three or four years right out of World War II, right in the gut of his career when he was one in 20 and 25 a year. So he'd have won another 100 ball games easy. Did you guys never, ever even think about asking anybody for an autograph when you were playing? Well, not not as much as I did afterwards when we were doing all of our alumni stuff, you know. 
but I got a, I got a few like uh, you know Lemon and Wynn and those guys when I was playing. I remember just... I remember Bob Lemon. Uh, they, the clubhouse kid came around the locker room with a baseball to be signed. And I signed it. I didn't sign it in the sweet spot. I signed it on the large part of the of the ball. And a few minutes later, Lemon walks over to my locker. I'm I'm like 21. He's 40. And he said, "Hey, Bush, I'm, I got to say it like you said it." He said, "Small fucking name, small part of the ball." <laughs> I said, "Okay, sir." <laughs> and the manager got to sign the sweet spot. <laughs> well, there we go. What'd you say? And the manager got to sign the sweet spot. That was the only time you ever got to sign the sweet spot. Well, unless you were Sandy Koufax, he signed wherever he wanted to. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, beautiful. I think I think this this industry has you know been through its ups and downs for, for a lot of years, and there was a lot of people doing a lot of bad things in it. And you mentioned the clubhouse kids. I can't tell you how many how many guys have have sat before me and said, "Yeah, I knew all the clubhouse kids, and I knew they signed everybody's name." And guys like Roy Sievers, if everybody knows Roy Sievers, Rookie of the Year, uh, Roy would sit around on, on a baseball and sign uh, pretty much anybody you wanted, and it would be spot on. That's true. That is true. You know what his nickname was, don't you? Who, who, uh, Sievers? Yeah. The Squirrel. Squirrel. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. Well, luckily, the, the business has gotten, you know, went through all the ick and, and grossness, and, and now it's cleaned itself up, and Major League Baseball has done a great job with that. We've done a great job with that, um, holograms and, and uh, authentication, all the things we're doing uh, to make sure that this is all legit, so there's not a bunch of random stuff out there that's fake. So, um, I, you know, we just let everybody know that our whole goal, because of our stature in the game of baseball, is to make everything as legitimate as we can. And make sure everybody's, you know, on the same page and getting it done right. So, uh, without further ado, let us let us go to your collection, Mr. Bell. And and what we've let me, well, let me back up one time. So the the theory behind this program is you guys have a lot of stuff. Uh, all you guys that played the game for a lot of years, and and people have stuff in their closet. And the closet project came to the forefront for the alumni. And we're like, well, a lot of these guys have this stuff, and Either they don't want it anymore, they don't need it anymore, but it has value. And the history that goes along with the stuff in your closet has value. And people want to see the stuff in your closet. And so that's why this this, this program came online. Uh, Steve Jacobs is with us. He, he is heading up this program and, and is doing a great job of, of getting all this stuff kind of put in order. But um, Gary Bell is the first of our of our victims to, to have this discussion and so show some of his stuff. And get it out there in front of the populace. So um, let's just begin with that information. Um, Steve's going to help us by holding stuff up. Our first baseball that we're going uh, to uh, to bring to the light today is a Mickey Mantle. Where'd you get the Mickey Mantle ball, GB? Well, actually, uh, I got it at a golf tournament. It might have been an alumni tournament. And um, he and Hank Bauer were hitting with every group that came through on a par three. So I just happened to have a dozen baseballs in my bag. <laughs> I don't know why they got there, but anyway, I asked you if you'd sign them. He said, sure, send them down there, I'll sign them all. And that's that's exactly how I got most of them. And then I had some relationships with him later on. Yeah, he was uh, he was a little vicious sometimes about stuff. Like there I, was uh, a famous baseball out there that we've talked about the other day that uh, that Eddie Fisher told the story about. And I know you know where that, that story is going, but uh, it was Beat the Pro, right? It was what? Beat the Pro. So you got a baseball if you were inside of Mickey Mantle, correct? Oh, something like that. Yeah, that might have been that tournament. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, Mantle, you know, Mantle, we had kind of a relationship because he had a tournament in Joplin, I think it was Joplin, Missouri every year. And I got invited. I, I I think he invited me because he hit so many home runs off me. You know, I said, "Well, what the hell?" <laughs> but during the introductions to the, of the celebrities and the ball players that were there, he said, "I'm going to thank Gary Bell for putting me in the Hall of Fame." <laughs> I said, "Well, I'll kiss my ass with you." <laughs> he thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> Absolutely. I well, Mickey, drilled, Mickey I always signed for the guys, right? I drilled him in the head a couple of times. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just saying, Mickey, Mickey signed for you guys a lot. I mean, I know that he took care of the foreign players. He he didn't like signing for everybody all the time, but 
he always took care of the former players, right? Yeah, he was. He was until he started drinking too much. He was, <laughs> he could get a little squirrely. Then no, no, no offense on our other boy. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> well, that's a good pick. A good ball. Let's see it one more time, Steve. Sorry, bring it back to the light. That's a good signature. Very that good. Is. I've really gotten good at putting those down, you know. <laughs> you can't say stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm just joking. You can edit, you can edit that part. <laughs> Very good. Very good. All right. So the next ball we have, speaking of the greats, uh, Mr. Ted Williams, speaking of losing time to the service in the middle of his career, there's oh, a Ted yeah. Williams ball. Tell us about where you got the Ted ball. Actually, it was at, uh, at a fantasy camp in uh, in Florida, the Red Sox fantasy camp that we used to go to every year and still do after 50-something years. Uh, yeah, he, came, he used to come down for a couple of days, you know, and kind of do a little PR and sign balls for us and stuff. And, you know, he was very good. He'd, he'd sign anything you gave him, you know. That brings up a story about Williams. Uh, Bill Mumbuket and I, got hooked up in a pitching battle years ago and uh and mambo to this day well he's gone now but he told me he said you struck williams out three straight times in that game and i said i did i said i'm not admitting that i did but i sure am glad to hear it but he said williams was really pissed off at you i said well why not anyway ninth inning comes up i'm ahead two to one he hit one in the upper deck in Cleveland. Well, if, we, if you remember the old Cleveland Stadium, it was a rocket. I lose three to two, so <laughs> that's my story. <laughs> what have you done for me lately, Bell? There you go. I should have just drilled him the last time he came up, and I, you know, I've been three up on him, you know, but didn't. <laughs> it's that, that competitive fire. You're like, I can get him for four. Let's go. We, we could do that back in those days, you know. <laughs> that's right. That's exactly right. So that's a, a Ted Williams ball. A, again, nice signature on the Ted ball. Um, next one, Stan Usual. Stan the man. Well, you know, I didn't really know him other than I met him at a golf outing. And um, I think it was Bob Miller, an old pitcher with several teams. Ted, I mean, Stan was in a car going, getting ready to go somewhere, and I had balls I wanted to sign. So uh, Bob leaned in and said, would you mind signing these three balls for Gary Bell? And he said, sure. And that's that's about all I had as far as knowing him. Now, he did play in one of those all-star games, I think, that uh, that I played against. So I did play against him in some form. Well, you guys didn't cross, cross-pollinate, cross man. He was a National League guy, and you weren't. Yeah, he, yeah, that's true. And he was really, a, a, from what I hear, it was a super man and a really nice guy. What did you do with the other two balls? I had a, had a, one of the other two balls. <laughs> well, I think my ex-wife stole two of those two. <laughs> so you want to get on that? I was oh. He took all my Sandy Koufax balls. I'm so pissed. <laughs> did she? Yes. Very good. Very good. I, I won't go any more detail. No series bats. <laughs> you knew good. that was going to come up, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> This is how it goes. This is how it goes. All yeah. right. The next ball. Um, a lot of people still think the home run king. Uh, when you when you hear this name, uh, definitely made a name for himself uh, in a couple places. Um, Milwaukee and then Atlanta for sure. Uh, Hank Aaron. Let's see the Hank Aaron ball. How'd you get the Hank ball? How, how do you even recognize that? That's a, that's what most players sign their stuff like that with weird, weird, can't even see who they are. But now he, uh, he, he and I were, oh, in some kind of a, probably an alumni function when I was with Mudcat and he introduced me to him and he, he signed a couple of balls. He wasn't very nice to me though. You know, it's, it kind of big lead me a little bit, but that's okay. Really? Wow, even with the Mudcat introduction, because he and Mud were buddies. I know, I know. Speaking of, I got about 45, 50 minutes on Mudcat if you want to go that route. <laughs> Absolutely. We all know Mud. Mud was one of our board of directors at the alumni and one of the one of the best, man. We miss Mud a lot. And, yeah, uh, I miss him too. 
you guys used to run together. What's what's your what's your line? You, the, you and you took you to the Apollo Theater. Oh, I've got it written down here. That <laughs> actually, Mudcat and I met uh, in 1955 with the Indians in spring training, first year in baseball for both of us, and um, and we stayed friends for 60 years. Here's a black guy from Florida, racist up bringing and terrible the way they treated guys down there. And a, and a Texas boy that was raised in a racist area the opposite way. And we found out pretty quick that really we weren't racist toward each other anyway, you know. And we just uh, we just gelled and played together. And I got a funny, one of the funniest stories about Mudcat is uh, we were heading, as our second year in pro ball. We were on a bus heading north to play in Reading that year in the Eastern League. So we, we had about five black guys on the team and uh, we stopped in South Carolina at a restaurant to eat. So we bounced off the bus and and Don Hefner, the manager, and I and, and some of the black guys went up to the door and they looked at Mudkid and the guy said, well, you guys can't come in. I said, well, what do you mean they can't come in? Well, black guys are not allowed. He said, you can eat in the kitchen if you want to. And I said, oh, yeah. So Don Hefter and I and Mudcat went in the kitchen to eat. And we get in there, and all of the cooks are black. And they said, you boys did the right thing because we put shit on white folks' food all the time. <laughs> we love that. We love that. <laughs> I don't know what they put in there, but it wasn't good. <laughs> you ever had a fly burger? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Very good. That's a good one. <laughs> All right, the next ball, uh, Mr. Joe DiMaggio, one of the staples in the memorabilia business. Mr. Joe D. You know, I didn't, I never met him personally, but a very good friend got, got the autograph for me, and, and I didn't have a lot. He was pretty tough to deal with, you know, after baseball, if, if I understand. You probably know more, more about it than I do. He died here. That, did he? Yeah, he lived here in Phoenix. All I know is he was married to Marilyn Monroe, you know. <laughs> was indeed. Well, you knew Dom pretty well, didn't you? Didn't you get to, get to know Domi? Who? Oh, Dom yeah, Dom. Well, yeah, yeah, I, I got to know Dominic very well because he was a Boston guy. And, and we spent some time together up there quite a bit, yeah. Yeah, Joe DiMaggio was probably one of the best players in history, obviously. And uh, But he was he was kind of cranky, and he, you know, about stuff. And he... Uh, I remember Robin Roberts, the Hall of Fame pitcher. He uh, he told me one time at a golf tournament that he was in the same cart with DiMaggio and out on the golf course, away from everybody. And he said, I asked Joe to sign a baseball. He said, he looked at me, he said, you too, Robin, and wouldn't sign it. That's pretty rough, pretty rough there. <laughs> Another Hall of Famer, by the way. That's hard. Yeah, that's a hard deal right but, there. I wouldn't mind having him on my team, though. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Hands down. Hands down. Very good. Okay, next one. The guy you played with, Carl Yastrzemski. Oh, Carl. Carl was one hell of a ball player. I mean, he was he 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 was he had it all, man. He could run, throw, hit. But um, by that time, when I got traded over to the Red Sox in 1967. You know, I was getting a little more knowledgeable about autographs and stuff. So every chance that I get, I'd get I'd get Carl to sign a couple for me. <laughs> Pretty soon, I got about two dozen balls by him. So I was I just kept loading them up. <laughs> I loved it. I told him you're you're my retirement. <laughs> At least Carl, you're honest about it. <laughs> but Carl was Carl was good. He was he was. He had a lot of home runs, and when I when I was starting, which I was at, at Boston, he had a home run, and and it always happened when he rounded third and came past home plate into toward the dugout. The guys in the dugout would reach up to shake his hand, and I always made sure I was right in front of that line. So he, finally, they would hold me, and I could I couldn't get up there first. <laughs> take care uh, of the people that take care of you, man. Absolutely, I get it. Baby, absolutely. <laughs> but no, he was. He was a, he's a great player. Good teammate? I think so, you know. He's a, he was a little distant. He's not real social, you know. He didn't like doing a lot of stuff. And 
except the stuff he gets paid for. But uh, yeah, he, he was fine. I, I got along with him, you know. You know, the sad part in my career is, is I could have signed for the Red Sox originally. They would have had they, they would have had Williams and left, Pearsall and center, Jackie Jensen and right, Malzone, Dropo. I mean, that's a pretty good lineup to play for. Right, could have won a couple more games with that. Oh my God, they go well, you know. The, the 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 Red Sox scout when I was a kid he almost lived with me he was he was all <laughs> over me every day and I signed with Cleveland because all of their superstar pitchers were all pushing forty years old you know, you know Wynn Garcia Lemon they were all getting old so I figured well if I'm going to make it that'll be the way to go so uh, that happened uh, didn't know that the cheapest bastard in the league you know at the time <laughs> Gabe Paul yeah. I, yeah, I got that big four thousand dollar bonus. Bought a fifty-six, bought a fifty-six Bel Air Sport Coupe Chevy with that baby, twenty-six hundred. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Wish That's I had it good. now. It's worth a hundred grand. I was gonna say you could salt that on on this little <laughs> podcast here, and we've been all uh, making money. Uh, picture of that car, yeah, for sure. <laughs> but, but Carl was he was just um, he was one of those guys, especially in '67, that he just he just came and rose to the occasion. Every time he we needed something, he would hit one out or he did, he'd do something good. Yeah, that was that was a hell of a series with the Cardinals, right? I mean, that was one of those ones that was back and forth. And well, we were 101 odds to not to win it. I mean, we weren't even picked to do anything, and we won it on the last day with I think it was three or four teams in Detroit, Chicago, Minnesota. All of us were right there, a game or two apart, you know. And, so it was, a, it was, New England was on fire that year, boy, it was just crazy. Kids had transistor radios in the school, at the school, and it was just good, it was just good stuff. I didn't realize how, how, what a big deal it was going to be, because, you know, at that point in 67, you weren't that far removed from, from the last World Series, relatively speaking. And then a whole lot of years passed before they actually got it done. Well, that's true. They claim, people do, that, that are in the know, they claim that that team, turned that whole organization around because they never they never had even drawn a million people and we drew a million something that year and, and from then on it just it mushroomed so the 67 team was pretty highly thought of you know over the history yeah it's one of the special ones for sure yeah. okay we talked about him a little bit um the last ball is mudcat grant jim mudcat grant longtime cleveland indians he's in 100 uh, 100 greatest indians too isn't he I think so. Yeah. 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 I went to Mudcat's funeral a couple of years ago and surprisingly there was only two guys there at uh, former players. I don't know what, what that was about, but Duke Sims and I were the only two guys that went and I got up and uh, spoke a little bit about him. And I told that story about us going to that restaurant <laughs> that kind of softened the mood a little bit. <laughs> yeah, but, absolutely. But, but Mudcat, you know, I, we, but God, he he would take me with him to all of uh, to the to the uh, African American side of town. I'd be the only white guy within miles, you know, and, and I felt comfortable. Really, he told me one time. I said, he said, "GB, I think you got some black in you." You know, I said, "Really? <laughs> well, I know who my mama was. I'm not so sure about my dad." <laughs> he took you to the Apollo Theater, did he not? What? He was the Apollo Theater. Didn't he take you to the Apollo oh, with well, him? Getting to it, yeah. First of all, he used to take Woody Held and me and Sam McDowell with him all the time down to the Howard Theater in Washington, which was uh, uh, in the in the, uh, the, the the black side of town, just so to speak. And God, we'd see guys on at, on, bat, on matinees like Sam Cooke and Clyde McFadder and and all those great black singers back in the day. And you know, it costs like five bucks to go to the show. And then um, we'd go to Cecilia's across the street. And it was kind of a bar, but we weren't drinking yet. We were playing that night. At least I wasn't anyway. And, <laughs> and she told me, Cecilia told me, says, he says, Gary, she said, Gary, you don't need my cat to come down here. You come down here anytime you want, honey. I said, oh, thank you, honey. <laughs> okay. You're very charming. You're very charming. So, Once people get you in the in the blood, that you can't get rid of Bell. That's the thing. I don't know about that, but... So anyway, the Apollo Theater. We 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 were in New York to play the Yankees, and uh, and um, Mudcat said, uh, "No, I I said to Mudcat, I said, you know, Aretha Franklin's at the Apollo Theater tonight.'" 
And he said, you guys want to go? I said, well, yeah. So when the game's over, Mudcat, me, Sam, and Woody Held, we go to the Apollo Theater. And when we get there, the lights are all down. The show had started, so it's, it's completely dark. So the show's over, great show, great show. And uh, lights come on, and Mudcat likes to say it this way. He said it was the, it was the three of them and all of us. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? <laughs> we were the only white guys in the place. And Mudcat said, well, I'll, I'll see you guys. I got to go. I said, bullshit, you ain't going anywhere. I, we went out there like a little train with arms around each other. <laughs> That's pretty good. I have the um, Joe Puppetone uh, HBP Ball, which I know Gary's dying to tell that story. Oh, tell the that's, HBP story. That's a good story. Yeah, much cat signed the ball. He took up the whole freaking ball. You couldn't, there wasn't any room left for anybody else. James, Timothy, Mudcat, Grant, that stretch that baby. It's like Cal McLeish, 35 names. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, but you want to get on Pepitone? <laughs> sure. Oh, gosh. I was in the bullpen then, so it had to be in 60 early 60s, three, four, five, somewhere in there. So we're in Yankee Stadium, and I'm out in the left field bullpen in those days. Then it's a sunny day, and I got my hat off and the jacket off, and I'm getting sun during the game. So about fourth or fifth inning, anyway, the game was going to Stan Williams was pitching for the Yankees, and uh, Barry Lapman was pitching for the Indians. And every inning, somebody's getting knocked down by a pitch. So, you know, it's kind of normal in those days. So anyway, um, they come, uh, they call out and ring me up to come in the game about the fifth inning. So I come in, then I got my jacket in my, under my arm. And Max Alvarez, the third baseman, comes over and says, uh, I said, are you the bat boy now, Max? He said, no, but I got a message for you from Bertie Tebbit. He said, drill the first freaking hitter that comes up there. I said, oh, shit. And I said, do you see who's coming up? It was Stan Williams. Anybody knows Stan Williams, he could pinch your head off with a drop of a hat. I mean, a bad boy. I said, Max, you see who's coming up? He said, yeah. I said, well, if if I drill him and he comes after me and you don't help me, I'm freaking running. He said, I'll help you. <laughs> okay. So so the, he comes up to hit, his pitcher hit. And so I drilled him in the ribs. He didn't say anything, went to first. And then uh, next inning, poor little Mike Delahose is our leadoff hitter. And, and Stan just turns him upside down with a fastball. His hat went down, just down he went. And Bertie Tebbis is pissed. He comes down and gets right in my face. He said, I don't care who comes up for the Yankees next to him. Mantle, Barra, I don't care. You drill those son of a bitch. And, uh, uh, and he said, if you don't, I'm fine. you a hundred bucks. I'm making about eight grand a year then, you know. That's Real money. <laughs> I said, I'd hit my, my dad for a hundred bucks. <laughs> so anyway, Pepitone's the first hitter. Ed Rung is the umpire behind home plate. Pitcher's umpire, by the way. So first pitch, I threw, I miss him. I, I, it was behind him. He kind of looks at me. He gets back in there. Next was right over his head. Down he goes again. And later, years later, we were at a fantasy camp together. And that story came up, and he told me, he said, you know, I went back to Ed Rungi. I said, Ed, this damn guy's throwing at me. He said, you're not throwing. He's not throwing at you. Get your ass back in there. <laughs> <laughs> two, behind, two behind your head. And one. <laughs> so then third, when I finally drilled him in the ribs, now he has the first base, slowly. Talked about my mother on the way down there. And, <laughs> and got to first and kept chirping. And, I, and, so I, and finally, I, I just got to say it like it was. I said, well, fuck you, you Dago asshole. If you don't like it, come on out here. So, and that's nothing against the Italians. I love Italians. <laughs> uh, so anyway, he didn't appreciate that. So he headed toward the mound. And, and Freddie Whitfield, my first baseman, jumped on his back about halfway to the mound. I stayed on the mound because those days the mounds were a little higher. I figured I got a downhill shot at these assholes when they come after me. <laughs> he thought Custer looked bad. Well, I was. <laughs> so anyway, the Yankee dugout empties and Mallow comes running toward the fight. Ralph Houck comes running. Their veins are out in their freaking necks. I stayed on the mound, so I was still going to get a downhill. Anyway, that big pile goes down between first and, and uh, the mound. So I said, well, this is stupid. Spikes and shit are flying. I said, I'm not, I'm not going to jump in the middle of that. So I never moved off there. Nobody ever got to me. <laughs> so the next day in the in the in the New York Times they had a panoramic view of the fight. 
And it showed me with my hands on my hips, looking at the fight, watching all these stupid assholes <laughs> knocking each other on each other. <laughs> so, that boy. Any, anyway, I, they threw three, four guys out of the game, and I wasn't one of them. <laughs> but anyway, we went, we went over that story, and that's where I got that baseball years later because he signed it. He said, hit by a pitcher, HBO. You know, I thought it was pretty cool. But, but, was he know, still holding a grudge? Uh, well, no, no. He, yeah. he knew he knew the game. You know, half the time they were we were told to hit people, you know, or knock them down or whatever. But I'm not so sure that wasn't more fun than in those days. You know, of course you could take a guy out of second base, and you know, so they could, there's ways of getting back at people, but not yeah, anymore. Yeah. You throw it an inch off the plate, and somebody's staring at you. I, I had to see early wind pitching against some of these young guys now. Bob Gibson, all those guys, man. Oh, him too. Yeah, him too, for sure, man. You know, the... I think that might be it, man. Yeah, I did went you want to talk about the... Jeff, did you want to talk about the process? I lost the... Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about the process, how this all works and fits together. Uh, um, and Steve, I'll let you kind of, since you're heading up the program, I'll let you kind of run down to what this looks like and how it works. Well, I took the alumni list and – broke it down and just started calling uh, some of the uh, some of the players. Um, once I got a hold of the players, I explained to them, you know, what we were trying to do with uh, items in their closet. It could be in their storage unit. Um, and then uh, once those phone calls and everything were made and uh, they players would get back to me and they would uh, have a list of items. Uh, we paid for the shipping. We would uh, send the, uh, shipping labels to them by email and they would ship the items in. Once I got the items in, uh, then I photograph everything. I've uh, got them cataloged and on certain items uh, that uh, they acquired the autographs on and they didn't have like the MLB authentication. We have a, a signed affidavit that uh, they did in fact uh, get these autographs on their own. And then uh, we put the authentication through uh, LMC and uh, once we have all that stuff cataloged, we uh, put it up on our Shop Legends site uh, and people can actually go on and purchase these items. Uh, we've already sold some of Gary's balls already and uh, it's uh, it's been a great experience. Uh, Gary is really good to work with as the other players are really good to work with. So I, it's just a really, really fun project and I'm glad to be a part of it and glad to get to know Gary on a personal level. He's one of the best, one of the uh, hey, my favorites hey, of all time. Jeff, we didn't get to talk about that home run Louis Tiang gave up. You got time? Sure, tell the story. You Close with a good story, to Louis Louis Tiang story. Louis, Louis, uh, we're in Baltimore, and uh, and we're sitting in the first base dugout. Louis pitching, and uh, Frank uh, Frank, uh, you know, damn brain went dead. Just a Hall of Famer, so I don't. And, and, and I, sometimes my brain doesn't click. Anyway, comes up and Louis throws one. You know how he used to wind up and throw his butt around and all that. So he throws some kind of little screwball, low and in, and 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 he hits that damn ball. And it, I said, "Oh hell!" And I got a bird's eye view if you're looking out to left field. The ball went out like a like a like a driver with a slight draw on it. Went over the top of the upper deck and, and then uh, it stuck up. And I think it's in Chesapeake Bay right now. But I said, "Holy shit!" So innings over. Uh, Louis comes walking in. I'm way at the right end of the dugout. I got away purposely because I didn't want to stare at him. <laughs> he comes in, and the first thing he says, in his the way he said it, he said, "Fuck you, Bell." I said, "What the hell did I do?" He said, I said, I, I said, how'd you hold that across the <laughs> uh, and then and the, and the whole bug was erupting laughing about it. And then the next Frank Robinson. Was, Frank Robinson, I'm sorry, but I said there you go. There but you go. The, okay. And anyway, the next um, the um, next day we come out to take batting practice and Louie and I walk out together and I, I said, Louie, what is that shit on top of the upper deck? And there was a little flag up there. It's, I always said it was H-E-R-E, -E, here. I said, Louis, what does that mean? 
He said, son, I'm not beat you. I don't know. That's no, that's no bueno. I said, yeah, well, you threw that down picture. That, that's where it went out. <laughs> anyway, guys, this was, was really a pleasure. I, 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 nice talking to you, Steve. And, and Emily's been very nice, too. And, and then, you, you know, you and I are too tight to even go into that. So That's right. We ran yeah. together. That's right. But uh, it's, it's been fun, and uh, and I love you guys, you know. Thanks, GB. Appreciate the time, and I'm glad we're getting to move some stuff for you. So uh, next time I see you, actually can buy a beer, which would be great. I will do that. <laughs> okay, bud. <laughs> so long. Thanks a so bunch, buddy. See ya.